now for our very last session, um, which we have sadly reached at, uh, at this stage. But um, this uh, looks also to be a, a, an excellent discussion to finish on. And uh, it's actually a topic that is, is not really given a lot of airplay, but is, is nonetheless very interesting. And I'm assured is very topical, is very much of the moment. So leading the discussion, um, we have here uh, Maxine Skikluna. I hope I pronounced your name properly there, Maxine. And uh, she is an aircraft engineering expert at Lufthansa Technik. And she is joined today by her team of panelists who I'm going to let her introduce. Uh, Maxine, I'm gonna unmute you and we're gonna ask the, the, the panelists here, your panelists to switch their microphones on and switch their videos on so that we can they can join us here in the room hello good morning lorna good and morning. good evening good evening um to the rest uh, of the audience um hi so yeah maxine shikluna slightly different lorna but never sorry <laughs> i have noted for next time <laughs> forgive me yes <laughs> Um, so thank you very much for the opportunity to moderate this very interesting um, session that we have to end with. Um, it's been a very interesting day. Congratulations on um, organizing this interesting conference. Um, and really, we are already showing our photo that I will use to introduce our discussion about interiors. Um, I'm not sure how many people in the audience would have had the opportunity to see an aircraft um, in, the state, in the state completely bare. Um, so unless you're working in heavy maintenance like I am or else maybe in the areas um, where our three panelists are coming from, then this is not um, a usual sight, I must say. Um, so what you have there is, is an aircraft which is um, completely stripped away from all furnishings, which we are usually um, uh, used to seeing. So just to put you in perspective, this is an, an A320neo. Um, I'm afraid the photo is a little bit elongated. The, the, the scaling is not right, but it's an A320, so it's, a, it's an aero body, a smaller aircraft, I would say, because I'm I'm coming usually from the Airbus family and there uh, we're, we're seeing the 330s, 340s, which are way bigger. Um, but this A320 is what you would typically be flying in um, in continental flights. Um, so I'm sure everyone has basically uh, flown on an A320. But um, what we will describe now is actually the process of how a business owner or operator can actually change the aircraft from this state to what um, a VIP aircraft looks like ready for operation. Um, and to do that, um, I have um, a panel of three experts here coming from three different sectors um, which are necessary in this transformation process to have our aircraft with, with a cabin worthy of flying. Um, and to start with, I would like to introduce Eric Julien from AC Jet, so from Airbus Corporate Jets, um, and this is the manufacturer. Um, we then have Tom Chatfield from uh, Canberra Aviation Management and last but not least Tobias Labs from Camlux, who is um, the, the completion center or in uh, let's say more common terms for everyone's understanding. Um, Comlux have a hangar where the aircraft is towed into and the cabin is fitted. Um, so I will, I will leave it up to you guys um, to briefly please introduce yourself and your role in this process of transformation. Um, uh, so where does your company and your role fit in in the bigger picture? And I will ask Eric to start here. Thank you very much for the introduction, Maxine. So um, our company, as you just mentioned, and uh, you just shared the picture, is delivering an aircraft in a green configuration, meaning an aircraft uh, without any uh, passenger airline amenities and without any linings, as you could see. Uh, the idea is that uh, a passenger cabin is a customized item and industrially it cannot produce on a production. So we deliver the aircraft like this to the, to the end customer. Then the end customer is relying on outfitters and completion managers to uh, make it a whole package 
uh, Airbus offers some of these services, and I guess we'll come back to that later, but uh, it is not mandatory. You can go for whoever is there on the market uh, and has experience on outfitting the aircraft. Mm -hmm. And uh, Tom, I guess you are next then in the process. <laughs> yes, thank you, Maxine. So, um, yeah, my name is Tom Sheffield. I'm the CEO of Cambria Aviation Management, and and basically we're a we're a team of experts. And what we do is we provide uh, completion management uh, advice to our uh, our clients. Essentially, what we do is um, is we sit and meet with the client. We we work to understand what their requirements are, and then we assist them in the process of transforming that vision of what they would like to see as their corporate jet into the masterpiece. So we work very, very closely with Airbus and with Boeing to uh, on the green aircraft side and understanding what the limitations are. And very, very closely, obviously, with the completion centers such as Tobias's group with Comlux in, uh, in working together to actually transform the idea to the finished product, which is going to be certified and, and flying. Yes, great. And Tobias, so just to um, finish there the process, yeah, absolutely. My name is Tobias Labs and I work for Promlux. Um, I'm in the fixing business. I have three daughters. They bring things to me and say, Dad, fix this. And uh, <laughs> professionally, we are also in the fixing business. We're fixing aircraft operation and we're fixing aircraft cabins and we do transactions as well. So the picture that you have seen, that's not fixed. And once it comes to us, it's fixed. And then it looks like uh, some of the pictures you see in the background. So we do interiors for aircraft, new ones and also modifications. Excellent, great. So I, I hope now that our audience can understand better, um, especially even the diversity of, of, of the jobs involved in order to have a finished cabin, which um, our VIPs are flying in. Um, and to present you with the first question. Um, so we have a cabin in that state, bare, completely empty, and we need to have our result at the end, which is a workable cabin, which can meet the requirements for the owner or the operator. So with a blank piece of paper, where would you start from? How would you go about defining what you want, what you need um, in order to have the final result? So Tom, I believe you can walk us through the process and maybe explain step by step um, how to go about this complex complex task, I would say. Of course, I'd be happy to. So generally what happens is, is clients have, if they've had an airplane before, they have a pilot, they have a financial advisor, and they have a lawyer. And, uh, and quite often they start at that process and think that they can go out and not only acquire perhaps a green aircraft or a used aircraft to refurb, but uh, to basically put the whole process together. And, and what what we actually end up have often doing is having to educate them and saying, these people are really great at what they do. That's a great pilot and that's a fantastic legal guy and, and your financial advisor is making you very wealthy. But I think you need a technical expert to be able to help you through the process of actually defining what you need and to, uh, to assisting both the OEM and the completion center in, in, in delivering that product. So what we do is, as experts, we sit down with the client initially and say, in very many open questions, what are you looking for? And the questions will, will basically uh, center on how many uh, passengers do you want to fly with? How far do you want to fly? Uh, what are your expectations of service on board? Do you fly into small airports? Do you fly into large airports? All of this uh, leads to what kind of aircraft that that person may or may not require. Once we understand what aircraft it is, then we start talking about what are the services that they require. Do they, is it a long range aircraft? So they'll need to be able to sleep on board. Do they need a shower? Um, do they put great value in fantastic fresh meals? Or are they happy with something getting thrown in the microwave? You have everything from the left to the right on that. And, and basically once we have that, uh, that basic understanding, then we sit down with, uh, with the uh, shortlisted designers. We explain what the the client is looking for and we work very closely in, a, in basically a three-way between the client and the designer and the uh, and ourselves to take that initial vision of what the client wants and transform that into first a, uh, a deck plan what does that uh, uh, what's that cabin going to look like in terms of layout and then into two and 3d uh, renderings and to be quite honest it's very similar to someone buying a piece of property for their first time if you can imagine you've got a great property on a lake and your spouse says, okay, now that we've bought it, what's it gonna look like? What is that fantastic house gonna look like? 
And you sort of look and say, well, I'm not an architect. I don't know. I know that I want a pool and I want a great bedroom with a fantastic view, but I don't know how to do it. So by bringing in an architect and a construction manager, you can figure that out. And many times for, for well, for myself and for many other people, as soon as you have that first sketch, it's easy to say, I like this, but I don't like that. And that's an evolutionary process. We do exactly the same thing, when it's, whether it's your house on the lake or it's that, uh, that uh, corporate jet that you want to design the interior of. By getting that first layout, you can then start critiquing it and it becomes an evolutionary process. Once you've understood that and you have the two and 3D renderings, which tell you what the finishes will look like, then we transform that into a very, very detailed completion specification. And the reason that we do that is because when we then go to people uh, such as Tobias and, and discuss what the client is looking for, he has a very detailed specification. He can sharpen his pencil and give us a very good quote, not in terms of just what it's gonna cost, but in terms of how long it's going to require. Because the more detail he has, the more he's able to sit down with his engineers and scope out the whole process. If you don't have a good specification, and we've, we've had experiences like that in the past where we've come in and helped a situation, it becomes very difficult. The, the completion center is doing the very best that they can, thinking that with the details that they have, that they're doing the right thing, and the client has a completely different vision. And you're re leading everyone up to, unfortunately, conflict, and that's what we don't want. So once we've got that specification and we have the completion center's bidding, we assist the client in, in picking the right completion center. And then basically we start that process of, of taking the design and transforming it from design to design intent to engineering. And a lot of times we sit down with some young engineers and say, look, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You guys did this previously. It worked really, really well on that project. Just use the same system again, right? Um, so we have some very good discussions. And if we, if we get rid of it, any of the conflict in the beginning by having a good spec, then we have a great working relationship between the client, between the completion center, ourselves, all the various suppliers, and it becomes very collaborative. And, and I think um, both of my esteemed colleagues will agree that when everyone's collaborating well, the end result is much, much better for everybody. You have a, an excellent aircraft. And as we go through that process, we're doing uh, the, com the uh, completion center is creating drawings, the um, Completion manager goes through the drawings, checks things, makes sure that everything is being understood. Uh, many times we'll put our heads together and try to figure out a solution to a complex problem and basically watch that whole process, do the quality checks. And as we get to the end, we'll be doing the, uh, the uh, certification testing and getting the airplane ready for ground and flight testing, and then eventually um, the technical acceptance of the aircraft. So a long answer to a simple question, but that's really what the whole process is. Yeah, th thanks for the detail, because in fact, like I said, I said it is a complex process, but when you break it down, when you have, you know, multiple steps, you can actually get it into smaller steps, which are then um, easier to deal with, of course, with the right people and the right expertise. Um, so, Eric, um, when it comes to ACJ, vis-a-vis um, um, Tom and the completion um, management aspect, um, how are the the interactions between the two companies, between the two roles. Can you describe briefly about that aspect? Sure. Um, one very important thing to keep in mind is that during the sales process of the aircraft, uh, obviously it's a great platform and I'm not going to go into the marketing pitch, but it's a cabin that sells, meaning that at Airbus Corporate Jets, we do have experts that are showing a layout, low pass to the customer, trying already to give a general overview of how the aircraft will look like. And by doing that, we, we must be careful and professional, not showing him something that will get Tom and Tobias uh, totally what the hell is happening, what that LOPA is. So we need already to find something that is certifiable and that is actually manufacturable. So that's the first step. Then of course, uh, to answer your question, Maxine, um, we always welcome that the customer has an expert that knows about completion, about these liners, knows what the step are, and Tom described them very well. And at the end as well, uh, we do have a network of approved outfitters, meaning they've been audited technically and on many different criteria. and complex completion in Indianapolis is obviously one of them. So 
what we like is to see that chain into place. As I said earlier, we can do some parts, like for example, we can also offer completion management turnkey services. Uh, we do some subcontract the part 145 uh, because we don't have that uh, capability. So we, we, we can offer the chain or we can see it. And uh, we had transaction recently where the key message we delivered to the customer was plan ahead and that means when you know you're buying the plane, that's where you need to start planning the cabin. And during the construction of the aircraft, you do have enough time to plan your cabin, but do it right now. Plan ahead and talk to professionals. Excellent, uh, excellent. I really like the example about buying a property because, you know, when you're when you're building the layout, unless you know what kind of kitchen you want, for example, you wouldn't know where to put the electrical sockets. So it is literally all about planning way in advance. And when you think, am I too early thinking about this topic? Then that is usually the time when you need to think about it. And uh, just to link to the topic um, of, of timing, Tom. So um, what are we talking about when it comes to, um, you know, dates? Are we talking about days, weeks, months? or years when it comes to completion. So maybe then, and also Tobias can add on his end, his perspective. Of course, let's keep in mind the big variety of aircraft cabins we can have. Um, but if you try and maybe speak on average about, um, about how long it will take someone to have a finished aircraft. So, so Maxine, there's, there's really, you know, it, there's, there's sort of two things. We're talking about biz liners right now, but I think it makes sense to sort of take an example and say, if we had a, a Bombardier Global or a Gulfstream, the, mm -hmm. the owner has a, a palette of choices, much like if you want to go and spec your BMW. You can take this and you can take this, but you can't take this. And once you've spec that out, that airplane gets built in accordance to those requirements. So basically, you have a, a palette of what you can choose. These airplanes are completely different. As you saw with the cabin, it's completely empty. And within the limits of your imagination and of course certification, you can then design what you would like to have in your aircraft. So yes, you get some really wild questions. No, you can't put swimming pools in airplanes and a jacuzzi really won't work. But there are a lot of things that are surprising with what you can do. So when you want to design the aircraft and you want to do it properly, I agree completely with what uh, Eric is saying and that is, before you buy the airplane, you should have a concept of what you want to do with it, right? Mm -hmm. And you are going to need on an aero body a good eight months of lead time in terms of being able to do the design work, get the engineering done. And ideally you want the airplane to arrive just as your engineering finishes and the work has already begun. Because Tobias has to take, his team has to take everything out of the airplane and there's still quite a bit to take out, put all the infrastructure in, and then install the actual finished cabin. So there's a huge amount of very, very complex project management that, that a good completion center has to do well. So about eight months lead time is great for a narrow body. If you can do 12 months for a wide body, you're gonna be in a much, much better position. And no one has ever complained about saying, geez, we had too much time on this project. Mm -hmm. it's, it's never happened, okay? Mm -hmm. so, so I think it's really important to take the time that you have. The other thing that's incredibly important is you don't want your client to have have accepted the airplane from Airbus, for example, and parked it at Comlux, and you're going to wait for six months before something happens. That's not only because of the cost of the airplane just sitting there, but it's also the excitement that, a, that an owner has. They want to have that airplane. They want to go flying it. It's their new, mm -hmm. it's a really great toy, right? So that's the timelines you're looking for. And a, a narrow body, depending on how complex it is, I would say on average, you're gonna take between 10 and 14 months to do that interior and, and do the painting of it. But I'm sure Tobias has some, uh, some better insights on that too. Yeah, indeed. I think uh, the, the project is lost or won in the preparation. Um, and there's never a too early uh, stage where you can start planning for that. Uh, unfortunately, the pitfall that comes is people think they buy the aircraft and we can talk about the interior later. And later means, <laughs> that the aircraft is delivered to the completion center or to the storage facility. Um, and then the discussion starts, how do I actually want to have my interior done? Um, and by that time, unfortunately, we, we have a situation that is too late. Uh, it means that the aircraft will be parked for quite a while. Um, and indeed, as Tom mentioned, there's a lot of preparation that needs to take place. There's a lot of engineering that needs to take place. 
Um, and the ideal scenario is that the aircraft arrives and before it arrives, the completion center had already the time to pre-manufacture certain elements that can be pre-manufactured um, and don't have to wait for the aircraft arrival. But um, it can only be started if we know what the client wants and if it's defined in terms of what is mm -hmm. exactly the layout, what are the systems that are included um, and, and many other details. And I think mm -hmm. people underestimate the uh, complexity of finding the final solution. Everybody thinks, well, I know what I want. Um, but then once you're given the choice, um, there is a lot of details to choose. Uh, sometimes people are not just one decision maker, but a, a party of two or three. Um, different interests come in and then there's discussions internally. Do I want it like that? Do I want it like that? And it takes time. And um, then that's when, when actually the delays are introduced is when, when the deadlines for having the cabin configured and, and defined and specified are not met. Um, and then it, it runs into late. And of course, the completion center is the last one in the chain. <laughs> I'm probably the one to get blamed for any delay. It's most get probably. Get probably so. um, and <laughs> everybody has the expectation, well, the aircraft is there. Why don't you start? Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In no, fact, so. it, leads me, it leads me to a question I was going to ask him. I'm not sure if it's for Tobias or actually Tom when it comes to actually ordering the interior. Um, uh, so, so um, Tobias engineers and uh, and team of designers can do designs, but my assumption would be that you need um, other third party companies, um, OEMs, to actually provide you the parts. So I guess that would be another element which has to be taken into consideration that you have to decide what you want, design, order, and get the part, and then you can install finally. Yeah. Exactly. In, indeed, it's uh, beyond the pure aesthetical aspects of it and the design. There's a lot of systems definitions that comes behind it or with it also. Um, there is uh, elements like seat, like uh, seat structures that on the one hand you would say, who cares? But um, it's the mechanism that, that uh, actually makes the cabin comfortable in the end for the passenger because the, the most time uh, that they spend on the aircraft is in an aircraft seat. So it's quite important to choose the right uh, supplier for the aircraft seat structures. Um, and those are typically long lead items, which may last uh, six months, some, some even longer, 12 months, or sometimes even 18 months, just to get the bare structure. Um, and then it needs to be upholstered. And on the upholstery, it's not that simple. It's not just putting foam and leather. I think there's a lot of vari variation that you can do. And typically, we also do uh, a testing of, of a, a first article seat where the principal can actually feel and, and, and try and see if the uh, density of the foam is exactly to his liking. There can be different layers of different foams um, that, that uh, can kind of form the final uh, feeling and, and comfort of that seat. And it's a complex matter that just, just yeah. takes time. Um, mm -hmm. So it needs to be defined early and ordered early and then, then the process is run. Yes. And Tobias, um, Maybe one, one last question on my end in terms of, of time frames. If we assume that all goes as planned, so um, uh, once the aircraft is towed into the hangar and the physical work actually starts, assuming that the planning has been done, the parts are ordered, they are at hand, um, just to put even the audience into perspective when it comes to the physical work, um, what would be an average time frame that the aircraft is sitting in the hangar and getting the work done? For example, for the A320 that we saw. Yeah. For, for the A320, I think a, a time frame between 10 to 12 months is a very realistic time frame. Um, if everything is planned well, uh, there's no issue in that. If the cabin has a normal complexity, I think that's very well achievable. So about mm -hmm. is, is this is this an addition to the time we have been saying before of planning 10 to 12 months or, or part of it? Well, I mean, again, if you start early enough, you're starting to talk about the aircraft uh, purchase and typically those uh, aircraft are not on the shelf so that you say, I purchased one today, I have it tomorrow. Um, mm -hmm. Typically there's a lead time now, which is one, two, three years. Um, so if you use that time wisely, then that's plenty of time to plan and prepare and design and engineer um, so that you're absolutely ready the moment as a completion center, the moment the aircraft delivers. And then it's really aircraft delivery plus 10 to 12 months, um, aircraft re-delivery to a very happy customer and start flying. Um, 
the delays come if you don't use that time to the delivery date um, of the green aircraft uh, to plan for the completion, then everything slips. No, but. If I may yeah. just jump in there, because what Tobias said uh, is super important. You do have time and the lead time between ordering the green aircraft and delivering the aircraft gives you sufficient time to be planning for your cabin. And yes. if you follow that pattern, timing wise, it's going to fit nicely. And that has been proven on many occasions. If I like the image, if you wait until you are like three months from the green aircraft delivery, what am I going to do with my cabin? That's where the problem starts. Otherwise, mm -hmm. it's it's a, it's a it's a um, sorry it's a process that is that is complex, that has some very uh, defined element design uh, and downtime for outfitting. If you respect that step by step, things can go very well, and you have a beautiful aircraft, fully customized. And that's a, because Tom mentioned traditional aircraft manufacturer. That's the beauty of a business in general is within certification weight limits, you can really do what you want. Excellent, excellent. And Tom, how important is it for um, for a customer to, to set his or her expectations right really from the start? Have we lost Tom? Ah, I think we lost him just as I asked him a question. Um, well, maybe Tobias, I guess you also have experience in deal dealing with this kind of topic. Um, change of opinions, maybe change of strategy. Um, how important is it really to get it right from day one? Yeah. I think, to, to be honest, it's, it's a, a bit of a challenge because um, sometimes people that buy the aircraft are not, in that sense, uh, very technical people. They're, they, they're very successful in their life, that's for sure, and that's uh, common across all of them. Um, but in terms of understanding about aviation, some understand more, and for some it's even a hobby, and they're, they're very, very experienced in understanding what, what needs to happen. And some others have their expertise in other areas. And, and sometimes it's, it's important to set, I mean, sometimes it's difficult to argue on that, uh, but what is important with all of them is, is to set the expectations right and make everybody understand what is realistic and what can happen uh, in a certain time frame. I think that the risk is if you overpromise and then afterwards you, you cannot deliver, uh, people are going to be unhappy and, and that needs to be avoided. And therefore setting realistic timeframes and expectations is, is really key to a successful project. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, moving on to another maybe completely different topic, and now we speak about the interiors themselves. So we're in 2020 and I, I was really... Um, I'm curious to understand how have things changed internally when it comes to cabin designs. Um, so basically, what are the latest trends? Of course, I understand this would be um, in respect to the aircraft type, because, um, you know, like Tom mentioned previously, it depends if you're going to sleep on the aircraft, for example, whether it's a long range or if it's a short range and you are going to work, um, work, dine and maybe relax. Um, but also, not only in terms of interiors, I wanted to ask also maybe in terms of technological advancements. So what are our users when they're flying um, and requiring or asking for in terms of technology? So maybe I address the question to both of you and uh, you can decide. Who I can <laughs> just step in from, from the OEM, OEM point of view. Uh, one important thing is... Uh, the shortest range of a product, we're talking about 6,000 nautical miles, so we're talking about beyond 12 hours. So the, the, the basic of uh, having a, a bedroom with ensuite showers, it, it's quite uh, a given. Um, mm -hmm. we, we are monitoring a lot the technology because uh, a lot of the technology, like if you take, for example, uh, connectivity, uh, that, that, that is uh, the next great thing, or um, um, as well the K, KU bands, this needs to have a provisions on the aircraft. Um, obviously, uh, Tobias and Tom are more an expert than us on that, but from our perspective, the biggest trend we see is towards uh, wireless equipment. Uh, we are we are just talking about now streaming the video. No more cables. No more no more heavy boxes, which allows to keep up with the technology uh, quicker. Always faster internet. Uh, again, you want to have the same connectivity level as at home at your office. Uh, talking about conference calls. I just mentioned streaming as well. All of applications. You also want to have 
uh, high definition television and maybe one day you will have a 3D uh, uh, TV video on board. So these are the trends. We, we need, to, whatever you have in your yacht or in your villa, we need to be able one day to have it in a plane. And that's where uh, broadly where we see the trend in terms of uh, entertainment. And another topic that we see a lot of questions, especially now in these COVID times, are about the quality of the air. So we've been asking, mm -hmm. uh, we've been asked a lot of questions about air recirculations, about the mm -hmm. capability to actually take the air of the outside to reject it without recirculating it, even if circulation is very limited. But still, there's always questions about that. Humidification, comfort on board, um, uh, mood lighting as well, the capability to fight jet lag through uh, luminotherapy, finding different uh, ambience of uh, colors, sunset, sunrise. So from OEM, these are really roughly the, the main trends that we see. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Just to link to that one, um, in the start of the conference today, we had a, a very interesting presentation about medical topics in, in relation to flying. And I was going to ask, um, for example, not only technology, but also possibly medical equipment and flying hospitals. Um, I'm not sure if you have come across these or if you have any comments to add. Um, Tom, just to, just to um, update you, we're discussing about latest trends and the latest um, technological advancements in, uh, in today's world. So, so I, I would agree with, with, with both gentlemen in terms of um, communication. Um, internet can't be fast enough, it seems, in our, our new generation. It, when we all want to stream faster and faster. And what's interesting is when the owner gets the bill the first time that he, he sees how expensive it actually is, you'll, you'll fall off your chair. Um, we had a, a flight attendant on one of our flights that was under the impression that Skype is free. So uh, on a transatlantic flight, she was live with her, her sister for the entire flight uh, on video conference. Um, unfortunately, she was let go when they landed because it was a $75,000 bill for the, for the flight. So I think you have to be very careful with streaming. Yes, someone's ultimately got to pay for it. Um, what we're seeing too is, is uh, a requirement not only for the clean air, which is what, what everyone wants right now and and cleanliness on the interior, um, but humidification is getting more and more um, into the limelight now. Where you looked at uh, aircraft 10 years ago where humidification wasn't as common, it's becoming very, very common now. It, it, it means that people mm -hmm. are going to be able to travel and feel better by the end of the trip. Um, what we're also seeing is less clutter. If you took a design from 15 years ago, especially mm -hmm. airplanes that are now coming for refurbishment, um, it tends to be more cluttered. There seems to be, how much can I put into my airplane? And much like in your, in your house, you don't tend to take your couches and shove them against the wall. You're now taking things off the wall to give a feeling of space. You're playing with the colors more to be able to give an illusion of more spaciousness to make it as big as possible. So I think those are things that we're seeing. And the other thing that is very strong is moving into the galley area is more and more people want to have fresh food on board. They don't want to have packaged things. So things that you're seeing from Yakobuchi with inductive cooking, for example, or having a, one of the flight attendants actually uh, as, a, as a very good cook um, is, is something that you're really seeing. Those are, those are very positive trends. Um, I like the, that, um, that uh, Dassault has been trying to do with, with putting small skylights in. I think everyone would love to have a, a large skylight. I think it'll be a virtual skylight actually with a camera outside and an interesting screen in the roof. Some light maybe. <laughs> I think that would be uh, that would be very cool. I think. Uh, yeah. A couple of clients. Very good. Um, we are moving towards the end of our presentation. Um, with the last minutes left. Lorna, I'm aware. Um, we do have a question. We do. Um, yeah, we do have a question from Heather Gordon. So uh, we'll get to that question um, uh, really soon in like two minutes. So just to conclude um, for our planned topics for the speakers, the last question I would like to ask you, and uh, maybe you can give a very brief answer each would be like, how far can we push um, the situation with, with cabin, cabin requests and, and interior furnishings? So like uh, is really the sky the limit as they say how far can we push it and so far in your careers what would you like to find that one most strange request that you have had so far for a cabin interior and after this we move on to the question i can say a recent request that we've had that, that hasn't been solved yet and we're working on is uh, i have a german client that really wants to have good draft beer on board the airplane and 
that hasn't been pulled off yet. So there's, uh, there's a difference in pressure there that we really have to think about to make it work. Because if you open your beer at 4,000 or, or at, uh, at almost 3,000 meters uh, on the top of a hill, you're going to find it foaming everywhere. So we've got to find some kind of solution for that. So I think that's, that's an interesting one. Yeah, definitely. So by us, sorry, Eric? Yeah, we had a request uh, to install a sports room on an aircraft, and so we did. Uh, we actually installed a sports room with full exercise equipment, um, a bicycle, and uh, even a weightlifting machine um, that uh, you find in a, in a proper gym, um, and we managed to do that. Um, I think the challenge, uh, Tom mentioned that already, jacuzzi or swimming pool, um, I don't think it has been done. I, mm -hmm. At the same time, don't think it's impossible. I think there could be ways of, of engineering that. You would just have to find a way that you can evacuate the water quickly enough into a safe tank um, in case mm -hmm. of turbulence. Uh, I think that would be a nice challenge to have, and we would be happy to work on it someday. Very good. And Eric, maybe one final concluding comment on your end? Um, on, on weird requests, we, we, we are not challenged as much as, as our friends. Uh, we had once a customer who asked who, if he could have a hatch uh, at the bottom of the aircraft, either to evacuate uh, with a parachute or to take uh, aerial pictures as well. So mm -hmm. thanks God we didn't uh, conclude with that customer. Oh, <laughs> great. Okay, so we have two questions at the moment. Um, let's start with the first one from Heather Gordon. Um, and she is asking, does the refit of cabin um, impact the value of the aircraft in the positive? And does this have an impact from a tax perspective? So anyone who wants to answer about that added value, positive added value and tax perspective? So I, I can't answer on the tax perspective, but the added value when you're when you're designing a, a cabin for yourself, it's much like your house. If you want to do something that is really wild and crazy that satisfies you, that's great. But you have to understand there may not be very many people out there that want to buy that house that looks that way. Exactly the same for a, an airplane. But I think if you have a well thought out interior that is attractive, that is, I won't say necessarily contemporary, but at least is, is appealing to a larger group of people, that will add to value because value is, is nothing more than the number of people that are interested in, in purchasing it, right? From a tax perspective, I can't tell you that. <laughs> I, I agree with Tom. The, the key issue, obviously you don't buy a plane for original value, you buy it for pleasure. But if you can factor in stuff that will preserve your original value, you will find out that at the end of the day, you can have a cabin that is very personalized, but will be very easy to move to another customer if you if you respect some basic ground rules. And here, I mean, anybody in this panel will have his advice. Uh, this is where you will have a huge influence on residuals. And, and even, even if the color scheme, for example, is very personal and, and there's subjective taste of everyone, that's very clear, but um, if you do a refurbishment of a cabin afterwards and change some of the materials, um, that's relatively easy to do um, and can completely change the character of the cabin and, and make it look appealing to a whole different group of people. Um, and therefore, that's definitely a solution that can preserve or even increase the value of, of an aircraft depending on how it is done and, and how it is styled. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, we have one final question um, and uh, roughly two minutes left here, just so that we are not um, going over the time. Um, this is about connectivity and education. So the question is, are customers being fully appraised of connectivity options based on their actual requirements? The Skype call, for example, um, which was mentioned, um, it's balancing speed and bandwidth but most of all costs. So are the owners being properly educated on this topic? Maybe we have time for one answer here. Um, I think they are. I think it's, it's Tobias's responsibility and our responsibility to understand what a client wants. And in many cases, you can say, look, you, you don't need to stream. The cost of that is incredibly high. If you want to text and, video, uh, text and, and send emails, that's perfect. And if you want to stream, we have a fantastic IFE system on board that already has all the movies loaded up. So that may be a solution there. In, indeed, there, there's various different uh, possibilities of fixing the, the need of communication. Um, and we as an operator are often uh, asked the question, what can we do? And then there's different suggestions. But obviously, we provide an overview on A, the capability, and B, also the associated cost. And in terms of connectivity today, there is quite a variety of different 
vendors on the market that, that provide solutions. And of course, they're competing. And, and uh, in the end, there's an overview. On, and you can clearly understand then what the cost is. And if you choose that option or that option, um, the volume of data, it, it can all be tailored. Um, and of course, that is made transparent to the client to understand what he's subscribing to. OK. Thank you very much. So it's exactly 1740, Lorna. So <laughs> very <laughs> impressive. <laughs> so, thank you very much to the three speakers. And again, congratulations on, congratulations on the interesting conference, Lorna. Thank you very much. Well, look, Maxine, thank you very much indeed for moderating that session. And uh, thank you to your panelists there, Eric, Tom and Tobias for joining us well and for your, your input there. I know it's always tough to go last, but you kept us entertained and informed, of course. Um, so once again, I'd like to thank all of our speakers, um, our sponsors, AIC, and to all of you out there for listening, and especially those of you that have hung on right to the end. Um, I'd also like to say a big thank you to my colleague and co-director, Alison Single, um, whose name we can see there. And she has been valiantly working hard backstage to make sure that all of this looks so seamless. Um, we're sending out an evaluation tomorrow. Um, so have a look out for the evaluation email and, and please give us your feedback and suggestions, which we, we really value and we'll try and weave any, any feedback you have into future events. We will also, with our speaker's permission, be sending out recorded versions of these proceedings. So have a look out for those. In the meantime, everyone, great to see you. Thanks so much for your support. Stay well, stay safe. And we hope at some stage to see you in person in, two, in 2021. So Absolutely. thanks very much, Bye. everybody. Take sure. care. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 B